Honorable Home Minister Sri Amit Shah Ji, Sri Sanjeev Sanyal, Dr. Samir Saran, respected guests, um, very warm welcome on behalf of HarperCollins Publishers to this launch of Sanjeev Sanyal's new book, Revolutionaries. The other story of how India won its freedom. My, my name is Udayan Mitra. I am executive publisher at HarperCollins oh. India. It's a great pleasure to have published this book and to be here today at its Delhi launch. And I wanted to first personally thank the Home Minister, Sri Amit Shah Ji, for gracing the occasion. I will very quickly introduce the author and the book and, and then hand over. Uh, and then, then we'll have the book launch and then I'll hand over to the author. Sanjeev uh, Sanyal, as uh, many of you personally would know him, uh, writer, economist, urbanist. Uh, his education was in Calcutta, Delhi, Oxford. And after which he spent about two decades in the international finance markets. In 2017, he joined the Indian government as the uh, uh, principal economic advisor. And he became a member of uh, the Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi's Economic Advisory Council um, last year in 2022. Sanjeev Sanyal is a best-selling author of several books and um, this is his latest book, Revolutionary is the other uh, story of how India won its freedom. Just a very little bit about the book, uh, you will hear in detail about it as, as we progress with the evening. Um, Veer Savarkar, Aurobindo Ghosh, uh, Bhagat Singh, Shubhash Chandra Bose, uh, Rashbihari Bose, uh, Chandrasekhar Azad. Th these are all names that we are familiar with. All of us know about their adventures and exploits. What we might not know and uh, what this book does underline is that their Acts of bravery were, were not incidental and, and they were not disconnected. There, there was a proper freedom movement that uh, took the form of armed resistance to colonial rule. And this stretched for a very long period of time and right up to independence and in some cases even beyond. And ran in some cases parallel to the Nonviolent uh, movement, and in some cases ran against the nonviolent movement. And it's if you separate the two strains entirely, then you actually do not get the full picture of uh, the India's independence movement, which culminated in the country becoming independent in 1947. What Sanjeev's book does is it brings it throws light on these stories which some of us know, the movement which some of us might not know, the, how connected the movement was, how strong the movement was, the extent of the movement, how far uh, reaching it was, and what were its results, e even, even in independent India, what kind of results has that movement had, the thinking behind that movement, what, what has it had. Um, it is a very gripping book. It is a delight to read. It is, uh, if I can use that word that is often abused, uh, it, this is truly unputdownable. Those of you who have read the book will, will know what I'm talking about. It is uh, really, you know, it's a thrilling story and uh, the material makes for uh, a thrilling story. Um, I think that's all I really have to say about it. You should discover the joys of the book for yourself. Uh, copies are on sale outside. Uh, uh, you will find the book in, in bookstores everywhere, whether they're uh, physical bookstores or, or virtual bookstores. Um, to continue with the evening, we wanted to first give you a quick glimpse, and it's a visual glimpse because we live in a visual age. We wanted to give you a quick glimpse into the world of the revolutionaries. 
and we have a video for you and uh, accompanying the video uh, will be the song will be a, a couple of verses from the song bande mataram uh, by makin chandra chattopadhyay uh, as you know bande mataram is our national song uh, the verses that we will be playing are not part of the national song so we do not need to stand when the when the song plays uh but interestingly these are verses that were very close to the hearts of the revolutionaries often these are the these are these are the verses that were on their lips as many of these revolutionaries went to the gallows where where they were sent by the colonial rulers so we will we will look at this video and uh, and then we'll proceed with the rest of the evening thank you May I now request uh, the Honorable Home Minister Shri Amit Shah ji, the author Shri Sanjeev Sanyal, Dr. Samir Saran, a President Observer Research Foundation, and Anand Padmanabhan, CEO of HarperCollins, to please come on stage. May I request the Honorable Home Minister to please formally unveil the book.
Thank you, sir. Um, may I request Sanjeev Sanyal, the author, to please speak on the book? Thank you, then. Good evening, friends. Let me begin by thanking the Honorable Union Minister of Home Affairs, Sri Amit Shahji, for taking time from what I know is an extremely packed schedule to come today to help me launch this book. Let me also thank Sami Saran, dear friend, for agreeing to discuss this book a little later with me. Anand Padmanabhan and his team at HarperCollins for helping me put this book together, particularly Udayan and Swati, my editors. Uh, Ujjaini and Saurav for giving the final form to the book, including the cover. Aman for putting together this event. I'd also like to thank the many people who helped me with many anecdotes, family, uh, relics, and so on for putting this book together. So let me thank also my cousin, Saurav Sanyal, for photos and letters of his grandfather and of Rajbihari Bose, Meenal and NMML archive team for uh, helping me discover a box of guns of the revolutionaries which had been lying around forgotten in the archives here. Um, in that uh, box, incidentally, we found several rifles, uh, bullets, uh, some of which are shown on the cover, by the way, um, uh, a, a, Mauser rifle, uh, a Mauser pistol, and an unexploded bomb, which thankfully we diffused. All of this is now on display in the Biplobi Bharat Museum in uh, Victoria Memorial in Kolkata. I would also like to thank Ashok Pal, who helped me. Uh, where is he? Is he here somewhere? There he is. Uh, he went with me to Nadia in West Bengal, and we traveled uh, across the district to many of the homes of some of these revolutionaries that are there in the book. Um, big thanks to Savitri Kankoji Soni, who thanked, uh, a big thanks to her because she introduced me to the world of her father. Pandurang Kankoji, a remarkable character who was not only a person who was a revolutionary, who fought in many uh, places, of all places, against General Dyer in Persia during the First World War, but is also remarkably the father of the Green Revolution. Finally, let me thank my wife Smita and son Dhruv for putting together the theme song using the third and fourth standards of Bande Mataram, which you just heard. As you can imagine, this uh, particular book is quite emotional for me. Um, in many ways, there are stories in here that I have grown up with because, as some of you will realize, uh, several of these characters are related to me directly, either through my mother's or father's side. But that's not the only reason I wrote this book. I wrote the book because I felt somehow, like many of you, that the story of India's freedom struggle is somehow incomplete. I always felt that. You get the impression from the official story that we Indians politely asked the British to leave and they left. That is not the entire story, unfortunately. This, there is another story of continuous armed resistance to the British going back to the 18th century. This book deals with the last 50 years of that resistance and what a story it is of spies, of adventure, of assassination plots, of absolute treachery. So quite apart from any nationalist feeling you may have, it's a fantastic story to read just because of the amazing adventures of these characters and amazing things that they were willing to do. Also, I thought it was important because although some of these people who put up this extraordinary resistance to the biggest empire on the planet. These events are, by the way, not a long time ago. This is not ancient events. These are events, some of which happened within living memory. So these names have not been forgotten. People still know the name of Raj Bihari Bose or Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose or Bhagat Singh, Ajit Singh and so on. But the impression you get from reading our textbooks is that they were individual acts of bravery. That was somehow unconnected to the wider story. At best, they were a side story got in the way of the main movement, which was the, uh, the passive movement of uh, nonviolent resistance. 
Unfortunately, that is not the story you come across when you begin to actually dig through the archives, look at the conversations that the British themselves were having, and of course the conversations that um, was happening in the, in the public discourse at that time. The revolutionaries were very much a part of public discourse, of the thinking of the, uh, of the uh, British intelligence of that time. And then, even to understand the Indian National Congress itself, you need the story of the revolutionaries. In fact, the Indian National Congress was, had lots of different streams, which included, by the way, many of these revolutionaries. They were powerful enough inside the Congress that Netaji Subhash Bose was able to win an open election against the Gandhians. Um, and, of course, it's a different matter that he was later on pushed out uh, through back room channels. But the fact is that even within the Congress, the revolutionaries were able to hold their own. And this sort of st story of uh, the revolutionary re re uh, resistance, unfortunately, was almost deliberately suppressed um, after independence. The reason for that is not far to seek. Almost all the senior members of the revolutionary movement were dead by this point in time. Whether it's Raj Bihari Bose or Sachindranath Sanyal or Bismil, Netaji had gone missing or dead, depending on your belief. The fact is when India became independent, there was no revolutionary leader of stature who could kind of be a part of the conversation. And as a result, a peculiar, a particular stream of the Congress party took power. And perhaps it's hu human that they would emphasize their own role. In itself, this is not wrong. But what I think is wrong is that there seems to have been a deliberate attempt to erase the memory of many of these greats who gave their lives and everything in order to make sure that we enjoy the freedoms we do today. Historians like R.C. Majumdar, for example, who had been originally given the job of writing the official history of India's freedom struggle, he was evicted when he began to talk about uh, these other streams of history. Moreover, it is important to remember that the revolutionaries were not just doing their little bit. They were linked to peasant movements like the Eka movement led by Madari Pasi, they were, led, they were linked to tribal revolts like those led by uh, Aluri Sitarama Raju, now made famous by RRR, but um, a person again much forgotten till this movie came along. So this is a much larger story. Unfortunately, independent India did not give them their due credit. The soldiers of the INA the sailors of the naval revolt of, of 1946 were not taken back into the Navy and Army after independence. They were not even recognized for decades as being freedom fighters. It's only very recently that they were given a, a recognition and it's only two years ago that for the very first time that INA veterans were actually parade, uh, taken for a parade. The few that are still alive today were taken for a parade down the Republic Day um, down uh, Kartavya Mark, then called Rajpath. So, this book really is my humble tribute to this extraordinary effort all these people did. This was a big effort involving tens of thousands of people, not only within India, but across the world. The revolutionaries had networks in Germany, in Japan, in North America, in Ireland, in Singapore. And many of the streams of our national consciousness to this day derive from the revolutionaries, even if you do not know this. And this is across the political spectrum. Whether it is the CPI or the RSP on the left or the RSS on the right and many streams of the Congress in between, many of them have their origins in this uh, revolutionary movement. It is even true, incidentally, of those who oppose India. Not many of you may realize that the Khalistani movement has its origins in the British attempt to subvert the Gadarites. 
So some of you may have wondered why is it that the Khalistani movement is, in, is based so much in Canada? Well, it, it is because the North American Sikhs were very much a part of the Gadarite revolutionary movement and they used to operate through a network of Gurudwaras which were then infiltrated by the British intelligence officer called Hopkinson. And large amount of money was spent in trying to separate the Sikhs from the Hindus and from the revolutionaries. And in a court in Canada, Hopkinson's were shot dead by a Gadarite called Mewa Singh. Now I'm quite certain there are almost nobody in this audience who actually has heard of Mewa Singh. But Mewa Singh actually shot dead Hopkinson back in, I think it was 1914 or 1915. So there are all these interesting characters in this book. I hope some of you will enjoy it. And um, I look forward to your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. Uh, may I now please request the Honorable Home Minister, Shia Shahji, to address the gathering, please. आज के कार्यक्रम में मंच पर उपस्थित श्री संजीव सान्याल जी डॉक्टर शरण और इस सभागार में उपस्थित सभी भाइयों और बहनों सबसे पहले तो मुझे मालूम नहीं पड़ता कोइंसिडेंट है या कुछ सोच समझ कर करा है इस पुस्तक का विमोचन इस सभागार के अंदर रखा है सोच समझ कर रखा है या को इंसिडेंट है मित्रों आज लाल बहादुर शास्त्री जी की पुण्यतिथि है सबसे पहले मैं महान देशभक्त हमारे प्रधानमंत्री लाल बहादुर शास्त्री जी जिन्होंने देश को सही रास्ते पर चढ़ाने के लिए देश की कई सारी देश बनने की प्रक्रिया को कुछ बोले बगैर भटके हुए रास्ते से सही रास्ते चलाने चढ़ाने के लिए बहुत बड़ा योगदान दिया मैं इनको श्रद्धांजलि देकर इनके चरणों में नमन कर कर मेरी बात की शुरुआत करना चाहता हूं रिवॉल्यूशनरीज the the story of how india won its freedom ye adhar story shabd likhna pada yahi ye pustak ka sar hai kyunki ek hi story narrative ke andar hamare janmanas par hammer kar 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 isko prastapit kiya gaya एक ही दृष्टिकोण जनमानस में शिक्षा के माध्यम से किवदंतियों के माध्यम से इतिहास के लेखन के माध्यम से थोपा गया है जो दृष्टिकोण थोपा गया है मैं ऐसा नहीं कहता कि अहिंसक आंदोलन का देश की आजादी में कोई योगदान नहीं है या वो इतिहास का हिस्सा नहीं है वो बहुत मजबूत हिस्सा है और बहुत बड़ा योगदान है अहिंसक आंदोलन का और कांग्रेस के नेतृत्व में जो मूवमेंट चली वो मूवमेंट का बहुत बड़ा योगदान है देश की आजादी में परंतु और किसी का नहीं है ये नैरेटिव ठीक नहीं है और मुझे लगता है कि सन्याल जी का ये पुस्तक वो नैरेटिव में बहुत बड़ी दरार डालने का एक अन्य स्वतंत्र विचार को लोगों के सामने रखने का काम करेगा ये बहुत उपयोगी है कम से कम आने वाली पीढ़ियों के लिए क्योंकि देश के आजादी का एनालिसिस अगर करते हैं तो ढेर सारे लोगों ने ढेर सारे विचारों ने ढेर सारे संगठनों ने और ढेर सारे मार्गो ने भी एक ही गंतव्य स्थान के पर जाने के लिए एक ही लक्ष्य पर जाने के लिए प्रयास किया था 
और वो सब का सामूहिक फल है हमारे देश को आजादी मिलना इतिहास को बारीकी से पढ़ना और इतिहास का जो संदेश है वो आने वाली पीढ़ियों में सटीक तरीके से देना ये हर पीढ़ी का दायित्व तो होता है और मुझे लगता है कि संजीव सन्याल ने अपने दायित्व तो का बहुत अच्छे तरीके से निर्वहन किया है और आने वाली पीढ़ी के लिए एक नए नैरेटिव की शुरुआत हो एक रचना हो इसके लिए एक पीठी का तैयार करने का काम संजीव सान्याल ने किया है मैं संजीव भाई को बहुत बहुत साधुवाद दूंगा मित्रों आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव है उसका वर्ष है पचहत्तर साल हो गए हमारी आजादी को मोदी जी ने इस पंद्रह अगस्त को पंच प्राण की बात की है उसमें से विरासत पर गर्व और गुलामी की निशानियों से मुक्ति ये दो महत्वपूर्ण पंच प्राण है पंच प्राणों का हिस्सा है जिस देश की नई पीढ़ी को और इवन वर्तमान पीढ़ी को अपनी विरासत पर गर्व नहीं होता है वो कभी भी अपने देश को महान नहीं बना सकते हैं और गुलामी के काल में प्रस्तापित हुई परंपराएं मान्यताएं और सोच को जो लेकर चलते हैं वो शायद राजनीतिक रूप से तो गुलामी से मुक्त हो सकते हैं परंतु देश की सोच को गुलामी से मुक्त नहीं कर सकते हैं ये जो मोदी जी ने कहा गुलामी की निशानी से मुक्ति इसमें सबसे बड़ा अगर कोई क्षेत्र में काम करने का जरूरियात मैं देखता हूं तो हमारे इतिहास को इतिहास के लेखन और इतिहास के अर्थघटन दोनों को गुलामी की सोच से मुक्ति दिलाने की जरूरत है ये प्रयास सबसे पहले एक भी शब्द बोले बगैर वीर सावरकर ने किया था पूरी दुनिया पूरा देश और अच्छे अच्छे देशभक्त सन सत्तावन की क्रांति को गदर के नाम से जानते थे पहली बार वीर सावरकर ने पहला स्वतंत्र संग्राम पहला स्वतंत्र समर अठारह की क्रांति करा वहीं से नैरेटिव को बदलने की शुरुआत की और आज संजीव सान्याल जी इस कड़ी को आगे बढ़ा रहे हैं इसका मुझे बहुत बहुत आनंद भी है और एक प्रकार से संतोष भी है कि जो काम बहुत समय पहले शुरू होना चाहिए था इतने समय के बाद भी अगर शुरू हुआ है तो ये स्वागत योग्य है इतिहास कई सारी मान्यताओं को जन्म देता है परंतु इतिहास हार और जीत के आधार पर नहीं लिखा जा सकता प्रयासों के भी कई डायमेंशन होते हैं कि कोई विचार कोई आंदोलन खड़ा हुआ हो सकता है वो अपने गंतव्य स्थान पर न पहुंच पाया हो सफल न हुआ हो इसका अर्थ यह नहीं है कि जब कभी भी वो उद्देश्य प्राप्त होगा तब इसका कोई योगदान नहीं है इतिहास को अगर हार या जीत के दृष्टि से ही लिखते हैं तो हम इतिहास को ठीक से नहीं लिखते इतिहास को वास्तविकता के आधार पर लिखना चाहिए प्रयासों के मूल्यांकन के आधार पर लिखना चाहिए और प्रयासों के सभी परिमाण इसके सभी डायमेंशन का एनालिसिस कर कर इसका विश्लेषण कर कर लिखना चाहिए भी इतिहास अपने आप में परिपूर्ण होता है और सशस्त्र क्रांति के इतिहास का भी ऐसा ही है कई इतिहासकार ये प्रयास को विलुप्त करने में लगे कई लोगों ने उसको कम महत्व दिया कई लोगों को लगा कि भाई इनका क्या योगदान था आजादी के प्राप्त होने में उन लोगों को मालूम नहीं है कि जब भगत सिंह जी को फांसी दी गई उस दिन 
लाहौर से लेकर कन्याकुमारी तक किसी के घर में चूल्हा नहीं जला था हर बच्चे के मन में एक आग धधकती थी हर व्यक्ति के मन में कभी न जिसका समन हो सके ऐसी देशभक्ति की ज्वाला जगाने का काम भगत सिंह की शहादत ने दिया था अगर आप भगत सिंह शहीद हो गए और देश आजाद नहीं हुआ इसके आधार पर ही इतिहास लिखते तो ये मूल्यांकन ठीक नहीं है मैं सिर्फ सिर्फ भगत सिंह जी के लिए नहीं कह रहा हूं समग्र सशस्त्र क्रांति के योगदान को इसका मूल्यांकन करना है तो वो आइसोलेटेड नहीं किया जा सकता मेरे जैसे कई लोग मानते हैं कि सशस्त्र क्रांति ने जगाई हुई देशभक्ति के ज्वाला के आधार पर ही कांग्रेस का आंदोलन सफल हुआ था मैं मानता हूं और मैं इसको सिद्ध भी कर सकता हूं याद नहीं करना चाहता परंतु मैं सिद्ध भी कर सकता हूं कि अगर सशस्त्र क्रांति की समांतर धारा न चली होती तो शायद कई दशक और लग जाते हैं हमें समग्र देश के अंदर बंकिम चंद्र चट्टोपाध्याय ने सिर्फ वंदे मातरम लिखकर चेतना को जागृत किया था क्या इसका कोई योगदान नहीं है समग्र देश के अंदर गदर पार्टी के पूरे प्रयासों ने अनेक जगह पे एक जबरदस्त चेतना की जागृति की थी निर्माण भी किया था चेतना सुसुप्त चेतना को जागृत भी किया और चेतना का निर्माण भी किया क्या इसका कोई योगदान नहीं है इतिहास के अंदर उसको इस प्रयासों का जो उचित सम्मान मिलना चाहिए था दुर्भाग्य से नहीं मिला है क्योंकि मैं राजनीतिक क्षेत्र में हूं इससे ज्यादा इसकी मीमांसा करना नहीं चाहूंगा क्योंकि वरना अकारण ही ये राजनीतिक विषय बनेगा परंतु आजादी के बाद जिनकी जिम्मेदारी थी हमारे इतिहास को हमारे दृष्टिकोण से लिखने की आजादी के बाद जिनकी जिम्मेदारी थी कि हमारे स्वतंत्रता आंदोलन को भारतीय दृष्टिकोण से मूल्यांकन करके युवा बच्चों के सामने रखने की मुझे लगता है इसमें कहीं ना कहीं चूक हुई अंग्रेज तो चले गए थे मगर जो अंग्रेजियत छोड़कर गए थे उसी चश्मे से पढ़कर इतिहास को लिखा गया और इसके कारण ये पूरा कंफ्यूजन आज हमारे सामने है ये धुंध को साफ करने का काम संजीव सानियाल के ये प्रयास से होने वाला है इसका मुझे पूरा विश्वास है मित्रों मैं इस बात को पहले समाप्त कर देता हूं बाद में पुस्तक पर आता हूं कई सारे लोग जब इतिहास के बारे में बातचीत होती है तब कहते हैं कि इतिहास को तोड़ा गया मरोड़ा गया कभी वामपंथियों का नाम आता है कभी अंग्रेजी मानसिकता वाले इतिहासकारों का नाम आता है कहीं कांग्रेस को भी कोई लपेटे में लेता है परंतु मैं अलग दृष्टिकोण से देख अब हमें कौन रोकता है मैं आज इस मंच से इतिहास के विद्यार्थियों का और इतिहास को पढ़ाने वाले प्राध्यापकों का आह्वान करना चाहता हूं कि हमारे देश के गौरव को व्याख्यात करे इस प्रकार से कोई तोड़ मरोड़ करे बगैर वास्तव दर्शी गौरवमयी इतिहास की रचना अब हो सकती है या नहीं हो सकती है मेहनत कियर कर रिसर्च कर कर हम क्या ऐसे 300 व्यक्तित्व ढूंढ सकते हैं जिन्होंने भारत को महान बनाया एक गलत अवधारणा इतिहास से सर्जित हुई जो इतिहास हम लोग पढ़े हैं कि पहला साम्राज्य मुगल साम्राज्य बनने के बाद ही हुआ ऐसा नहीं है इस देश में कम से कम 30 ऐसे साम्राज्य हैं जिन्होंने 200 साल से ज्यादा राज किया और बहुत अच्छे तरीके से राज किया वो मुंह जबानी बताया जा सकता है क्या हमारे इतिहास के विद्यार्थी और प्राध्यापक इस पर रिसर्च कर कर लिख सकते हैं क्या सन सतावन के पहले और सन सतावन के बाद 
कभी भी इस देश के किसी भी कोने ने अंग्रेजों को स्वीकारा नहीं है एक एक इंच जमीन के लिए उनको संघर्ष करना पड़ा है लड़ना पड़ा है ये क्या संघर्ष नहीं है आजादी बरकरार रखने का आजादी को बचाकर रखने का इसको क्या इतिहास में स्थान नहीं मिलना चाहिए ढेर सारे ऐसे लोग थे जिन्होंने सन सत्तावन की क्रांति के लिए कुछ न प्राप्त होने की स्थिति में भी ये लड़ाई लड़ी और मैं मानता हूं कि सन सत्तावन की लड़ाई ने ही इस देश की जनता के मन में स्वराज के संस्कार शिवाजी महाराज के बाद पहली बार डालने का अगर कोई एक प्रयास ने काम किया तो अठारह की क्रांति ने किया और वहीं से आजादी की लड़ाई की भूमिका वहीं से शुरू होती है इसकी नींव वहीं से डली गई है चाहे सशस्त्र क्रांति का इतिहास देखो या कांग्रेस का अहिंसक आंदोलन देखो इसकी नींव ढूंढने जाएंगे तो अठारह की क्रांति के अंदर से ही निकलेगा ये सब चीजों को समाहित करने की जिम्मेदारी सच्चे ऐतिहासिक तथ्यों को देश की नई पीढ़ी के सामने रखने की जिम्मेदारी सिर्फ सरकार की नहीं हो सकती मैं मानता हूं इतिहासकारों ने भी इसमें आगे आना चाहिए सान्याल का भारत और भारतीयता का लिए जो जुनून है वो देखकर मैं कई बार सोचता हूँ एक बार मुझे मिलकर निकले नॉर्थ ब्लॉक में मुझे विचार आया ये व्यक्ति कभी निराश तो नहीं हो जाएगा ना क्योंकि जो जुनून है वो अगर लंबे समय तक इच्छित परिणाम नहीं मिलाता मिलता है तो निराशा में भी कन्वर्ट होता है सन्याल भाई चिंता न करो इस वक्त मैं आपके साथ खड़ा रहूंगा निराश होने की कोई जरूरत नहीं भारत का समय बदल गया इस जुनून के साथ अर्थशास्त्री होने के बावजूद जो काम किया है वो साच अर्थ में अभिनंदन के अधिकारी हैं इनकी पुस्तक को मैंने बहुत डिटेल नहीं पढ़ा है मगर ऐसा कह सकता हूं कि कोई आप में से कोई पढ़ लेगा तो जितना बात करेगा उससे ज्यादा बात मैं करने की स्थिति में हूं इतना तो पढ़ लिया है इसके आठों चैप्टरों के बीच में एक वाक्यता है आप आठों चैप्टरों को अलग अलग कर कर नहीं देख सकते और आठों चैप्टरों को पढ़ के वक्त बारीकी से पढ़ना हर एक चैप्टर दूसरे चैप्टर से एक सूत्र के साथ जुड़ा हुआ है मैंने तो बंद कर दिया है अभी सार्वजनिक रूप से लिखना वरना मैं इस पुस्तक की विवेचना करता तो बहुत अच्छी करता है इसका मुझे विश्वास है ये आठों चैप्टरों के अंदर सिर्फ क्रांतिकारियों का वर्णन नहीं है क्रांतिकारियों के आदर्श क्रांति की सोच की व्याख्या उनकी मानवीय भावनाएं और उन्होंने अनुभव की हुई त्रासदी इस सभी को बहुत अच्छे तरीके से इन्होंने मोतियों की तरह एक माला में पिरोने का काम किया है और इस पुस्तक की सबसे बड़ी सिद्धि ये है कि आज तक सशस्त्र क्रांति के इतिहास को छुटपुट व्यक्तिगत प्रयास बताया जाता था ये पुस्तक पढ़ने के पढ़ने के बाद आप सबके मन में स्पष्टता हो जाएगी ये छुटपुट व्यक्तिगत प्रयास नहीं था बहुत अच्छे तरीके से एक सोच के आधार पर किया गया सामूहिक प्रयास था परंतु संख्या कम थी इसलिए छुटपुट दिखाई पड़ा क्योंकि सशस्त्र क्रांति करने के लिए कोई भी बड़े से बड़ा डल जाएगा अंत तो गतवा एक घटना के अंदर ही होगा और जब घटना का पर्दाफाश होता था तो बाकी सारे लोगों का अदृश्य हो जाना रणनीति का हिस्सा था परंतु बहुत बखूबी से 
इन्होंने इसको मोतियों को जैसे माला में परोते हैं इसी तरह से समग्र क्रांति के विचार को एक धागे में मोतियों की तरफ पिरोने का काम किया है दूसरे अध्याय में श्री अरविंद और वीर सावरकर इसके संबंध में लिखा है ये दोनों ऐसे व्यक्ति हैं एक ने सुस्पष्ट रूप से राष्ट्रवाद को जरा भी गाल मेल करे बगैर व्याख्यात करने का काम किया और दूसरे ने राष्ट्रवाद को आध्यात्म के साथ जोड़कर भारत ही विश्व गुरु बन सकता है इसका विचार की शुरुआत की ये दोनों के बारे में मैंने भी बहुत कुछ पढ़ा है मगर इन्होंने एक दो ही चैप्टर के अंदर इन दो के बारे में जो जानकारी दी है बहुत अच्छी जानकारी है इसको मैं रूपक में अगर बोलना चाहूंगा तो गागर में सागर की तरह सारी चीजों को इन्होंने समाहित किया है चैप्टर चार गदर आंदोलन के बारे में लिखा गया है और गदर आंदोलन आइसोलेटेड नहीं था इसकी सारी शाखाओं को इन्होंने बहुत अच्छे तरीके विस्तृत रूप से वर्णित कर कर गदर आंदोलन उत्कृष्ट राष्ट्रभक्ति से निपटा हुआ एक सामूहिक प्रयास था इसको सिद्ध करने का काम इन्होंने अध्याय चार के अंदर किया है पांचवा अध्याय काला पानी पर लिखा है जो भारत के आजादी के इतिहास का तीर्थस्थान है अंडमान की सेल्युलर जेल और वहां की दी गई मानवीय यातनाएं देखकर मैं कई बार सोचता हूं कि पश्चिम के देश कैसे ह्यूमन राइट की बात कर सकते हैं और किनको सिखा रहे हो भाई जो कोई भी हमें भाषण देता आता है उसको एक बार सेल्युलर जेल की मुलाकात करा देनी चाहिए अनेक प्रकार के देश के अनेक हिस्सों से पकड़े गए स्वतंत्र सेनानी क्रांतिवीरों को एक ही जगह पे रखा गया और अगर सेल्युलर जेल के अंदर जो क्रांतिवीरों की सूची है उसको भी आप देखोगे तो मालूम पड़ जाएगा आइसोलेटेड प्रयास नहीं था पूरे देश का नक्शा वहीं पर बन जाता है वो जेल में आज भी एक महिला कर्मी है उसने हर जेल से आए आए हुए आजादी के लड़ाकों का नाम लिया प्रदेश दिया और उसको जोड़कर पूरे भारत का नक्शा बनाया एक भी प्रदेश बाकी नहीं है भारत के हर प्रदेश से कोई ना कोई कभी ना कभी सेल्युलर जेल के अंदर गया है सेल्युलर जेल में वो ही जाते थे जिनको मारने से ज्यादा नुकसान होता था कोई उसको जिंदा रखने के लिए नहीं भेजते थे और जिंदा रखने का कोई मतलब ही नहीं रहता था ऐसा जीवन वहां देते थे तो इतना बड़ा प्रयास करने वाले व्यक्ति हर प्रदेश से आए वो ही बताता है कि सशस्त्र क्रांति आइसोलेटेड एफर्ट्स नहीं था व्यक्ति का व्यक्तिगत पराक्रम नहीं था एक सोची समझा आंदोलन था जो देश को आजाद करने का बहुत अच्छा प्रयास था छठे अध्याय में हिंदुस्तान रिपब्लिक एसोसिएशन के बारे में लिखा है अंतिम दो चैप्टर चटगांव शस्त्रागार के छापे और नेताजी की लड़ाई के बारे में लिखे हैं मैं अभी भी कहता हूं पढ़ते वक्त आप ध्यान रखना हर एक चैप्टर दूसरे चैप्टर के साथ जुड़ने का सूत्र इसके अंदर रखा हुआ है रखना तो क्या है है ही परंतु इसका वर्णन किया गया है और आठों चैप्टर को अगर आप एक ही चैप्टर मानकर पढ़ते हो 
तभी आपको मालूम पड़ेगा कि सशस्त्र क्रांति की अवधारणा क्या थी और सशस्त्र क्रांति करने वाले स्वभावगत हिंसा के पथ के अनुयायी नहीं थे सशस्त्र क्रांति करने वालों के लिए हिंसा देश को आजादी दिलाने का जरिया थी वो भी उत्कृष्ट मानवीय मूल्यों का अनुसरण करने वाले लोग थे परंतु ये चित्रण जो कर दिया गया वो चित्रण से हमारे इतिहास को और वो वीर क्रांतिवीरों को बहुत बड़ा अन्याय हुआ मित्रों मैं स्पष्टता से मानता हूं किस देश को आजादी दिलाने में साहित्यकारों का भी बड़ा योगदान है देश के किसानों का भी अनेक किसान आंदोलनों के जरिए अंग्रेज हुकूमत को हिलाने का उन्होंने काम किया जन जागृति की इसका भी बड़ा योगदान है देश के हर कोने में फैले हुए हमारे जनजातीय समाज आदिवासियों ने ट्राइबल्स ने अपनी परंपरा को हम प्रदूषित नहीं होने देंगे इसलिए अनेक जगह पे अंग्रेज के खिलाफ शस्त्र उठाए लड़े मरे सन सतावन के पहले भी सबसे पहली लड़ाई अगर कोई लड़ा था तो आदिवासी ही लड़े थे बहुत लेट कांग्रेस पार्टी ने एक अहिंसक आंदोलन भी शुरू किया जिसमें पूर्ण स्वराज बहुत देरी से आए मैं बताता हूं उसके बारे में बाद में और सशस्त्र क्रांतिकारियों ने भी दुनिया भर की अनेक घटनाओं से प्रेरणा लेकर एक भगीरथ प्रयास किया था हो सकता है कई घटनाओं का आप एनालिसिस करोगे तो आंदोलन असंगठित दिखेगा परंतु वो देशभक्ति से प्रेरित था और सभी का लक्ष्य एक ही था देश को आजाद कराना अंग्रेजों को देश से निकालना और आप इस पुस्तक को ध्यान से पढ़ोगे तो आपको मालूम पड़ेगा 1923 में ही सचिंद्रनाथ सन्याल ने भारत को रिपब्लिक बनाने का लक्ष्य रखा था मैं इसलिए कह रहा हूं कि जिन्होंने हाथ में हथियार उठाए थे वो स्वभावगत हिंसक नहीं थे परंतु अंग्रेज के हाथ में बंदूक थी इसलिए इसके सामने लड़ना ये हिंसा आदेश को आजादी दिलाने का एक जरिया बनाया था कांग्रेस ने 1930 में पूर्ण स्वराज की मांग रखी और हिंदुस्तान रिपब्लिक आर्मी एचआरए ने न केवल पूर्ण स्वतंत्रता का लक्ष्य रखा परंतु सार्वभौमिक वयस्क मताधिकार की भी वकालत उसी वक्त कर दी थी मैं उनकी दूरदृष्टि का, का परिचय हो इसके लिए आपको ये बात बताता हूं उस वक्त कांग्रेस के अधिवेशनों में मताधिकार की चर्चा तो थी ही नहीं आजादी कितनी मात्रा में अंग्रेजों से नेगोशिएशन कर कर प्राप्त की जाए इसकी चर्चा चलती थी परंतु उस वक्त न केवल संपूर्ण आजादी हर वयस्क को मतदान मताधिकार इसकी भी चर्चा की और बीसवीं सदी में ही शुरुआत में 1909 में वीर सावरकर ने कहा था अगर सशस्त्र शांति को क्रांति को सफल होना है तो इसका अखिल भारतीय स्वरूप तय करना पड़ेगा और उन्होंने अभिनव भारत की स्थापना इसी के लिए की थी और देश आजाद होने के बाद अभिनव भारत को बंद करने वाले भी वीर सावरकर ही थे कि अब अभिनव भारत का उद्देश्य समाप्त हो गया मैं ये इसलिए कह रहा हूं कि इसको छुटपुट प्रयास कर कर हमने ये महान प्रयास का अवमूल्यन नहीं करना चाहिए 
इसको किसी व्यक्ति की व्यक्तिगत देशभक्ति कहकर व्यक्ति की व्यक्तिगत देशभक्ति ही अपने आप में बहुत महान होती है परंतु एक समूह एक विचारधारा के तहत देश को आजाद कराने का प्रयास कर रहा था उसको हमें समझना भी पड़ेगा स्वीकारना भी पड़ेगा और प्रचारित भी करना पड़ेगा सिर्फ समझने से कुछ नहीं होगा उसको मन से स्वीकारना पड़ेगा कि मेरे देश को आजाद कराने के लिए ढेर सारे लोगों ने अपने जीवन का सर्वस्व बलिदान कर दिया कई बार घर की कुकरी हो गई कई बार परिवारजनों को जेल में डाल दिया कई सालों तक कोई अहमदाबाद निकोबाल के काला पानी की सजा भुगतता रहा कई लोग फांसी के फंदे पर चढ़ गए और इस प्रयास को हम व्यक्तिगत प्रयास नहीं कह सकते इसको विफल प्रयास भी नहीं कह सकते क्योंकि इसी के आधार पर हर जगह पे देश में आजादी की चेतना जागृत होती गई दृढ़ीभूत होती गई और परिणाम लक्षित दिशा में आगे बढ़ती गई इन्होंने आजादी की चेतना को जागृत भी किया उसको दृढ़ भी किया और चैनलाइज कर एक दिशा में ले जाने का काम भी ये सशस्त्र क्रांति वीरों ने किया है ये हमें स्वीकारना ही पड़ेगा उनका नेटवर्क जर्मनी सिंगापुर आयरलैंड कनाडा, अमेरिका और इंग्लैंड में भी नेटवर्क फैलाकर इन लोगों ने काम किया था उसक के गुजरात के मुख्यमंत्री नरेंद्र भाई जब मुख्यमंत्री बने गुजरात के तो मोदी जी ने श्याम जी कृष्ण वर्मा की अस्थियां इतने सालों के बाद वहां से वापस लाने का काम किया क्योंकि श्याम जी अपने व्हील में कहकर गए थे कि मेरी अस्थियों को एक बैंक के लॉकर में रखना जब मेरा आदेश आजाद हो तभी मेरी अस्थियों को मेरे देश में लिया जाए मैं गुलाम देश में मेरी अस्थियों को भी नहीं जाने दूंगा क्या उत्कृष्ट राष्ट्रभक्ति और इस प्रयास को कोई कैसे छुटपुट प्रयास कह सकता है इस श्याम जी कृष्ण वर्मा तैतरी उपनिषद का सबसे देश में उस वक्त उस जमाने में सबसे विद्वान व्यक्ति था संस्कृत स्कॉलर थे तैतरी उपनिषद पर उन्होंने लिखे हुए टीकाओं को मैंने पढ़ा है इनकी विवेचनाओं को पढ़ा है इतना विद्वान व्यक्ति सब कुछ छोड़कर देश छोड़कर वहां क्रांति वीरों का प्रेरणा स्रोत बना एक के बाद एक देश बदलते गए सरदार सिंह राणा हो मैडम कामा हो श्याम जी कृष्ण वर्मा हो सब ने आजादी के स्वप्न को स्वेप देने का काम किया इसको फैलाने का काम किया और सावरकर जैसे लोगों ने जमीन पर लड़ाई लड़ने का काम किया ये प्रयास ना सोच के बगैर का था ना असंगठित था ना असफल था ये प्रयास एक सोची समझी विचारधारा के आधार पर किया गया प्रयास था ये प्रयास संगठित प्रयास था और इस प्रयास ने सफलता जो मिली इसमें बहुत बड़ा योगदान दिया है इसको कोई नकार नहीं सकता मैं तो और ये बात आज सन्याल के पुस्तक से नई पीढ़ी के हाथ में जाएगी मैं एक वाक्य बोलना जाता जाता हूं मैं एडवांस में ही कह देता हूं मीडिया है वाक्य मेरा नहीं है तो मुझसे न चिपकाया जाए आजादी के आंदोलन की दोनों धाराओं को कुछ लोगों ने उस जमाने में एक्सट्रीमिस्ट बना मॉडरेट्स ये व्याख्या कर दिया और अरविंद घोष ने उनको नेशनलिस्ट बनाम लॉयलिस्ट कर दिया अब ये मैं नहीं कह रहा हूं श्री अरविंद घोष कह रहे थे मैं नहीं मानता इस 130 करोड़ की आबादी में 
श्री अरविंद घोष की व्याख्या और उनके उद्देश्यों पर कोई भी सवाल उठा सकता है मेरा बस इतना ही कहना है मेरी कोई टिप्पणी नहीं है मगर हमने इतिहास को एक्सट्रीमिस्ट बना मॉडरेट की धारा से निकालकर वास्तवदर्शी बनाना पड़ेगा अहिंसक आंदोलन का भी योगदान है इसको हम नकार नहीं सकते परंतु इसका महिमा मंडन करने के लिए हजारों हजारों लोगों की तपस्या जीवन के बलिदान और कुटुंब के कुटुंब फना हो गए इसको कैसे नकार सकते हैं और उसको नकार कर देश का इतिहास नहीं बन सकता है हमने कभी ना कभी सोचना ही पड़ेगा हमने समझना पड़ेगा कि आजादी अनुदान में नहीं मिली है लाखों लाखों लोगों ने बलिदान दिए हैं रक्त बया है पीड़िया तबाह हो गई है तब आजादी मिली है इतिहास को इस तरह से व्याख्यात करने का हमें प्रयास करना पड़ेगा और आज मुझे बड़ा संतोष है मराठों से लेकर लसी परफुगन से लेकर अठारह तक के सभी प्रयासों को आज समाज में सम्मान मिलने की अच्छी शुरुआत हुई है इसको और गति से हमें आगे बढ़ाना चाहिए नेताजी सुभाष चंद्र बोस के जीवन में आज भी मेरे जैसा व्यक्ति ओवरकोट पहनकर आया है कड़कड़ाटी माइनस फोर्टी फाइव डिग्री टेम्परेचर में कलकत्ते से निकलकर वाया अफगानिस्तान रसिया होकर कोई बर्लिन पहुंचता है वो व्यक्ति की देशभक्ति को आप कैसे नकार सकते हो मगर आज जब नेताजी का पुटला कर्तव्य पट पर लगता है तो मन को बड़ी संतोष और शांति मिलती है बड़ा संतोष होता है चलो देर से ही सही एक अच्छी शुरुआत हुई है नेताजी किसी की स्पर्धा में नहीं है और स्पर्धा के भाव से नेताजी के कान कामों का और महान प्रयास का अवमूल्यन कैसे कर सकते हो आप नेताजी तो वो तेजपुंज है जो पीढ़ियों तक हजारों हजारों युवा को देशभक्त बनने की प्रेरणा लेगा और देश के लिए जान देने की प्रेरणा आई एन ए का पूरा प्रयास मैं बहुत स्पष्ट रूप से मानता हूं मैं भी इतिहास का विद्यार्थी हूं स्पष्ट रूप से मानता हूं कि इसको जीतना सम्मान और स्थान देश के इतिहास में मिलना चाहिए था वो नहीं मिला जैसे भी मैंने पहले कहा आज देश का युवा अपनी रुझान को बदला है देश की मान्यताएं भी बदल रही है इन क्रांतिकारियों का प्रेरणा स्रोत प्रेरणा स्थान कौन कहां से आता है निश्चित रूप से ही शिवाजी महाराज महाराणा प्रताप लसित बुरफुगन बर्फुगन गुरु गोविंद सिंह जी वीर दुर्गादास राठौड़ वहीं से आता है और आज देश का युवा इस दिशा में सोचता भी है इसको स्वीकारता भी है ये सारे क्रांतिकारियों ने मैजिनी और गेरीबाल्डी से तो क्योंकि उस जमाने में थे तो सिखा ही सीखा प्रेरणा ली इसमें कोई आपत्ति नहीं देशभक्ति की प्रेरणा दुनिया के किसी भी कोने से मिलती है तो लेनी चाहिए और इसको सैल्यूट करना चाहिए परंतु इसके साथ साथ हमारे यहां भी एक बहुत बड़ा इतिहास पड़ा है देश के लिए सालों सालों तक के संघर्ष करने वाले लोगों का इतिहास पड़ा है वो ही हमारे क्रांतिवीरों के प्रेरणा स्रोत थे भगत सिंह को जिन्होंने ध्यान से 
जो कुछ भी लिखा है उन्होंने जो कुछ भी उपलब्ध है पढ़ा होगा तो सावरकर की सन सत्तावन की स्वातंत्रता संग्राम की पूरा प्रस्तावना उनके स्टेटमेंट का हिस्सा है ऐसे ही एक्सीडेंटली नहीं होता है उस वक्त वो प्रतिबंधित पुस्तक थी मगर उस पुस्तक से प्रेरणा लेने का मतलब है प्रतिबंधित पुस्तक को ढूंढा गया पढ़ा गया और उसको अपनी प्रेरणा का स्रोत बनाया गया ये वो बहुत बड़ी बात है और जब भगत सिंह जी को फांसी लगाई गई तब सावरकर ने मराठी में फटका कर कर एक प्रकार का काव्य होता है इसमें लिखा था हा भगत सिंह हाय हा तुम हमारे लिए ही फांसी जा रहे हो राष्ट्र रण में जूते ही घीर रहे हो आंदमान निकोबार की जेल में बैठा हुआ व्यक्ति ये रिएक्शन दे रहा है मित्रों ये मैं इसलिए कहना चाहता हूं कि पूरा समय आंदाबान निकोबार की जेल में निकालने के बाद बाहर हुए हुए सावरकर अगर ये लिखते हैं तो हमें होना चाहिए कि ये सब कोऑर्डिनेटेड एफर्ट्स से एक ही विचार से पनपे हुए एफर्ट्स थे और इन नेरेटिव को कुछ लोगों ने कुछ समय के लिए दबा कर रखा है मगर मैं इन लोगों को कहना चाहता हूं इतिहास बड़ा क्रूर होता है इतिहास को कोई तोड़ भी नहीं सकता मरोड़ भी नहीं सकता इतिहास घनघोर अंधेरी रात्रि में बिजली की भांति चमकता है भले सैकड़ों वर्ष के बाद हजारों सूर्य जितना दे दीप्यमान होकर बाहर आता ही है और उसको स्वीकार करना ही पड़ता है हमारे देश के स्वतंत्रता संग्राम के इस इतिहास को कोई दबा नहीं सकता कोई लुप्त नहीं कर सकता कोई छिपा नहीं सकता और समय समय पर इसको आगे बढ़ाने वाले लोग भी आए हैं और आगे भी आएंगे इस पुस्तक के अंदर आप ध्यान से पढ़ेंगे तो आपको ये पुस्तक भी इसी दिशा में जाता हुआ लगेगा हमारे क्रांतिकारियों के प्रेरणा का मुख्य केंद्र श्री अरविंद का भवानी मंदिर ही होता है इंडिया हाउस होता है गदर पार्टी का सोहन सिंह और लाला हरदयाल का मुख्यालय होता है और आए ने के हर जवान के मन में हमारी क्रांति का प्रेरणा स्रोत होता है मित्रों अनेक लोगों ने अनेक प्रकार से देश को आजाद करने का काम किया किसान नेता मदारी पासी सहदेव हरदोई और बहराइच सीतापुर में एका आंदोलन जो चढ़ा इसको गति दी अल्लूरी सीतारामन राजू अब तो बहुत एक फिल्म ने उनको प्रसिद्धि दी है और धरती आबा भगवान बिरसा मुंडा जिन्होंने को अंग्रेजों ने फांसी दे दी उस व्यक्ति ने भी अंग्रेजों के खिलाफ लड़ने का काम किया है इस पुस्तक ने बहुत सारे ऐसे व्यक्तित्व को भी परिचय करा है उल्लासकर दत्त मेवा सिंह लोपो के श्री वी एस वी वी एस अय्यर जतेंद्र नाथ मुखर्जी ढेर सारे व्यक्तित्व का भी परिचय करा है मेरा आप सभी से आग्रह है कि पुस्तक को जरूर मन से पढ़ना और फुर्सत में पढ़ना और इसको प्रचारित भी करना क्योंकि एक विचार है लिखा है हमारे सान्याल साहब ने परंतु ये विचार ये सनातन विचार है हमारे यहाँ व्यक्ति राष्ट्र और संस्कृति कभी अलग नहीं रहे हैं तीनों एक ही है ये हमारा मूल विचार है इस मूल विचार के आधार पर ही सशस्त्र क्रांति का नींव बना था और उसके आधार पर ही इसका परिचय कराने के पुस्तक लिखा गया है मुझे दिए हुए समय से मैं थोड़ा ज़्यादा बोला हूँ इसलिए आप लोगों का बहुत समापना के साथ और फिर से एक बार 
सचिन भाई को बहुत बहुत बधाई और शुभकामनाएं देकर मेरी बात को समाप्त करता हूं वंदे माता On behalf of HarperCollins India and all of us gathered here today, I'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to Honorable Home Minister Shri Amit Shah Ji for his gracious presence and for formally unveiling the book and also for his very erudite and very passionate remarks. Thank you, sir. We are indeed honored, sir, to have had this important book released by you. This book, which is a much needed intervention, as you very rightly pointed out, in the chronicling of a crucial aspect of India's freedom movement, the stories of its revolutionaries. It is our hope that this book, Revolutionaries, will once again revolutionize the country and inspire new generations of Indians with stories of courage, sacrifice, and patriotism. Thank you once again, sir. So, uh, you know, Sanjeev, before, uh, while some of them return, I thought um, I would, uh, in, a, in, a, in, in this setting, it would be fair to probably give a few observations that uh, um, I must make after reading the book. First was, when I was on page 37, I called you up, because I was uh, suddenly told that I'm going to be in a conversation with you, so then I had to make sure that I completed the book, so you, you alerted me. And you also told me that it wouldn't take too much time. And I can confirm to you that once you start reading this book, you don't put it down. I was thinking what your narration reminded me of, and I can certainly now compare your style of the jump narratives to the magician in, uh, from Mexico, Inarito, who made those fantastic films, where you would have these multiple stories interwoven, leading to a, a conclusion that was apparent rather than stated. And I think uh, I must congratulate you. Thank on you. this wonderful writing style, uh, it speaks about something emotive, but it does so in a manner which is pacey, which is breezy, which is uh, intimate, uh, as well as uh, absorbing. And, and I learned a lot, so thank you very much for this book, and let me congratulate you uh, for writing this wonderful uh, book, Revolutionaries, the other story of, of India when it's freedom, and also let me congratulate everyone associated with the book. But I must uh, give a special shout out to Smita, a dear friend, who has uh, taken your Janoon and added her spirit to it. And uh, you mean the, the song? The, the song, as well as, as, well as uh, I think in many ways, the, the anchor for uh, who you are today. And I think uh, I, I due credit to her as well. Uh, but let me ask you this, because when the uh, Home Minister was talking about the Janoon, uh, it struck me that whether I discuss telecom policy with you, the economic survey with you, the drone policy with you, uh, you, always, you always have that India first uh, and India must uh, do something approach. So when was Sanjeev Sanyal's Janoon born? When you were six, five, eight, nine? When did you see it becoming an essential part of your person? Well, um, I, well, I don't, I, as far as right now is concerned, I truly believe, like perhaps many of you do, and I know you do it uh, certainly, that this is our moment in the sun. And if you read my very first book, it's called uh, The Indian Renaissance, India's Rise After a Thousand Years of uh, uh, Decline. So I was writing this, by the way, 15, more than 15 years ago, uh, in, in round about 2005, so uh, 17 years ago. So you can imagine that the thing that really began to almost claw at me is the fact that, you know, we may have been a great civilization, but for so long we were in this phase of decline. 
And finally, we begin to see the glimmer of hope. So this is 15, 16, 17 years ago. And I think I'm beginning to feel even better about that idea now. Uh, we genuinely can see this energy. It's there, whether it's an industry, it's on the sports field. I mean, India has never been thought of as a great sport, sporting country, but you see it there. You see in the extraordinary explosion of all kinds of literature that is now coming out. So I think this is our moment in the sun. So I'm making my little contribution to the cause in a sense. Uh, but the... Thank you. But you may, you, your question was a slightly different one. Correct. What is it back in my childhood maybe that may have caused me to have this view of the world? And the reason for this, I think, is because I actually came from a state that in some ways went the other way. Bengal was at the cutting edge of much of what is there in this book. You'll see, you'll see Bengal is everywhere in this book. Uh, it provided the inspiration in terms of the song Vande Mataram, Sri Aurobindo, the audition on Samiti, all of this, uh, Netaji, Vivekanand, all of them were Bengalis. And yet I grew up in the Kolkata of the 70s and 80s and all that spirit was somehow almost been deliberately extinguished. I mean, Kolkata did not die. I, it was murdered and I'm a witness to that murder. So, so, Sanjay. And, and, and so let me finish this thought. So at some point in time, I became very, I began to develop this very strong view that how could a people who triggered this massive movement, led to, uh, you know, uh, triggering national feeling, modern India is almost created by Bengalis. And here we are in 1980s Kolkata run by Jyoti Basu. And it's completely stuck like this. So it sort of in some ways very deep down created this determination that you need to reignite this spirit again. And so it began to spread. I came to Delhi and then of course lived many places in the world. And it came to me that this spirit is something that is not, uh, it's, it's something that can be ignited. That, that somebody has to put in that effort. And if I can make a small contribution to that cause, so be it. No, I, I'll come to that point. That's a very important point. Our own assessment of our histories has a lot to do with our postures today. And I'll come to that point. I think that's important, something that comes out of this book. But let, let me go back to uh, what I felt when I was reading it. I felt Sanjeev Sanyal was actually narrating this story to me. And I could also sense uh, some uh, uh, expression of satisfaction in certain spaces, uh, uh, a disappointment in certain words. I could actually see you very intimately connected with the words that were written here. And of course, you explained why, because you had family uh, history connections, uh, and of course, also uh, archives from them that have been reflected in this book. But tell me, is this, does this give you the satisfaction of having completed a certain journey, something that began many years ago as a child? And perhaps this book captures a much longer arc of something that may have been inside of you and expressed through uh, a book like this. So as you mentioned, uh, many of these stories I heard as a child, because both my mother's and fam father's family were both very closely associated with the uh, freedom struggle in, and specifically with the revolutionary movement. But I wasn't fully conscious of the importance of many of the things that I heard about. So it may, you know, many of the characters that I mentioned in the book were still alive, by the way, in the 1980s. So in my teens, I actually knew them, like my great grandfather, Nalin Aksha Sanyal, who is in the book. But somehow, at that time, all these pieces didn't really fit together. It's about a decade or a little bit more than a decade ago when I began to actually research the book that many of these gnawing things in my head, which used to gnaw at me, began to finally fit together. So in some ways, while many of these things are bits and pieces that I knew or bits and pieces I found while researching my other books, it's only when I began to write this book that they actually began to fit together. So in some ways, uh, it was, in many ways, a discovery of India of my own kind, so to say, uh, where I began to discover much later on how these pieces fit together. So let me give you an example. Uh, in my 20s, I used to live in uh, Mumbai, 
in Kolaba. Um, and there is a small shrine almost you can call it to the uh, 1946 uh, naval revolt. Now I had never actually heard of the naval revolt till that point. So I just bump into this thing, a small uh, shrine and it says, you know, 1946 naval revolt. Now I asked people in Mumbai about it. Almost nobody else in Mumbai seemed to know anything else about, about this. This is extraordinary. This is in Mumbai 1990s. Today, of course, it's easier. You have to have Googled it up, but in the 90s, you couldn't do it. So it really nodded at me that, look, this must have been a very major event. So I, as I re researched it, and I discovered, oh my God, this is a critical moment in our history because it's during this revolt that Attlee decided to set up the Cabinet Committee on Indian Independence in 1946. This is the critical moment. And yet we know nothing about it. So in a sense, I had somewhere an angst that somehow our story didn't fit together. So it's only when I began researching this book that I began to find all these pieces and kind of be able to sew them together. Uh, there's also something very interesting you say right up front hmm. in the book. And then I'm going to come to pretty much the end of the book as well. Uh, up front, you suggest that uh, there seemed perhaps a symbiotic or at least uh, a, a, a synchronous or an asynchronous relationship between both the, the violent uh, and, and the revolutionaries and their determination to seek freedom and the nonviolent uh, 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 Gandhian uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, determination. Uh, in your assessment, was that an adjustment or was there any deliberate uh, ploy to maintain two tracks? Would that be a stretch of imagination, or was that only tolerance at most from, from the mainstream for the revolutionaries, or as they were called, extremists at that time? See, for the purposes of a book, one talks about two streams, but in fact, it's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. There were people who were in the, uh, uh, who, who were uh, full-time revolutionaries with armed revolt. Then there were their sympathizers. Mm -hmm. There were some who had been a sympathizer and moved to becoming actual revolutionaries. There were revolutionaries who moved towards the thing. You're talking about a Congress which was a big tent. There were all, the, of course, the loyalists. There were also the nationalists. There were many people in between. Different people did different things at different points in time. So, for example, you have the Swarajists. Now, the Swarajists are, of course, uh, the descendants of the nationalists or extremists, depending on what you call them. But Motilal Nehru actually was a member of that Swaraj's group for a period of time. Of course, he then drifted away. So there were many things going on here. You can't put exact, uh, sort of certainly not from today's perspective, put them in uh, neat uh, boxes. So for example, um, again, ideologically, if you, many of those who we would now consider to the right were considered then to belong to the left. Many of those who belong to the left were actually inspired there by people from the right. So for, I'll take Bhagat Singh, for example, who is very often, you know, example of early communist working for Indian freedom. But in fact, as he writes in his own, own writings, he was almost the only Marxist in an entirely non-Marxist movement. In fact, uh, but his inspiration, which was Sachindranath Sanyal, and he writes it very clearly in Why I'm an Atheist, his inspiration, Sachin Sanyal, was vehemently anti-Marxist. Hmm. And similarly, even within the uh, other streams, you find, for example, you have communists uh, um, and Marxists. There are one branch of them very much get almost captured, you can say, by the British Marxists like uh, Rajni Pal Medat. But then there are other Marxists uh, who remain quite suspicious of both the Russians and the British. And they end up in something called the Anushilan Marxists. And much later on, they then become a party called the RSP, the Revolutionary Socialist Party, barely exists today. It, I think, has just one MP, but once upon a time, it was a rather powerful party. So there were all these mix and match stuff. And even within the Congress, the revolutionaries, when they came together, were very capable of beating the uh, Gandhians, uh, even in an open election, as Netaji himself demonstrated. So, uh, you know, I, and, and I just want to take the point that you made in your intervention and, and something um, uh, that I read in the book, pretty much towards the end of the book. And this is something I, did, I had no clue about. 
So I must confess, I, I, this was the first time I encountered something like this. You suggest uh, in the early part that much of the, the, the tall figures of revolutionaries were no longer present at the time of independence, and hence their role and perhaps even their place in our history uh, could be diminished because uh, uh, of the pen belonged to the others who, uh, uh, who were writing history at that time. Uh, but you mentioned something which surprised me. You said, uh, if all the revolutionaries were dead, why did Jinnah celebrate uh, the, the, the army, uh, the, the members of the INA or the members of the, the armed rebellions and actually uh, mainstream them into, um, into Pakistan while we took uh, pretty much 25 odd years or 20 plus years uh, to acknowledge their existence? What was the difference? Revolutionaries were missing on both sides at the time of independence. So one of the uh, great uh, ironies of history is that uh, when you have the INA soldiers, they were, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, at independence, they were not incorporated into the Indian Army uh, and neither were the sailors of the uh, Royal Indian Navy revolt. But this was not true of Pakistan. The Pakistanis actually incorporated many of the INA uh, uh, soldiers and officers into their army. And in fact, the attack on uh, Kashmir in 1947-48 uh, involved many uh, former INA officers, including General Kiani, uh, who was at some point a number two in the, uh, in the INA. So there are many such interesting characters that were there. So that is why I will have to sadly say that in India, there was a definite, deliberate attempt to suppress this line of history. And you cannot escape this, you know, whether it's, you know, removing R.C. Mazumdar from the uh, chairmanship of the official history writing or, for example, very almost, uh, what should I say, vicious things. Uh, many people may not realize that the cellular jail, today it may be a national monument, but it was almost entirely pulled down. Many of the sites relating to the uh, uh, revolutionaries after independence were systematically actually wiped out. I'll give you one example right here in Delhi. Mamsi, which is mm -hmm. Maulana Azad uh, Medical College. Uh, it used to be the site of a jail where many of these revolutionaries were hanged. And so in the 1950s, the revolutionaries demanded that you uh, turn at least the area where the gallows were into a national monument. Mm. And the government of that time actually agreed to this. But then sadly what happens is that just a few years later, the whole place is converted into a medical college and they specifically go out of the way of demolishing the gallows area and building something on it. You know, a quick question to you because you mentioned uh, the change in uh, the authors who wrote our history post-independence. Um, and someone who got to know that I was going to be talking to you told me, you must ask Sanjeev. Uh, I'm in government, I can't ask him, but please ask Sanjeev that isn't it time to remove government for the, from the task of writing history and to promote historians and, and individuals and, and writers who, who, who perhaps write competing stories, but at least uh, lead to a wholesome uh, um, uh, uh, narrative of how complex those periods were, something that you mentioned in your book as well. Well, I work for the government, but my history writing is no, an entirely not, this pri is not a, this is not a private task. activity. Uh, but let me say, that absolutely, I think there has to be a much wider effort. But yes, there is a role for the government, in particularly in the case of school of textbooks, there has to be some standardization. While you can allow extra books to be there, but some standardization has to be there in government textbooks. So uh, therefore, that is an area where the government will play a role of some sort. Well, you know, uh, and similarly with na national mo monuments and things like that. Gautam Chikrame told me that if he had read your book and gone and attempted a school exam, he would have failed. Because, uh, Absolutely. <laughs> because it would have been out of syllabus. So, Not just so, that, the UPSC exam. So, <laughs> so, no, no, I mean, that's just an aside. We were just having a conversation on, on, on school types. So, uh, there's something, again, which is counterintuitive. You know, if you look at modern movements where we are seeking self-determination or separatism or any form of extremist activities, people tend to remer re revert to their more uh, primal selves. Uh, turn to religion, uh, turn to customs, turn conservative, turn fundamentalist, and you've seen this happening across uh, uh, the world. You suggest in your book that actually the revolutionaries were reformists, were seeking a, a modern society, were not, taking, were not taking India back, but were taking the society forward. Now, 
this is slightly counterintuitive in, mod, in terms of the modern day examples if you look at these such movements. What was driving this, this uh, modernist approach even as they sought uh, a revolutionary change? So here there is something that we need to understand. They were both modernists and in many cases religious revivalists at the same time. And this is very important to understand this. You have to understand that if you are dealing with late 19th century, you have had a country that has now been in occupation for quite some time under British rule. There is many impulses for modernizing, culturally modernizing. Of course, everybody knows about the earlier efforts of Raja Ram Mohan Roy, uh, Vidya Sagar, etc. But there were, and many of them were somewhat westernizing efforts as well. But there were other ef modernizing efforts too, led by the likes of, for example, Rani Rashmani, uh, who built the Dakshineshwar temple. And what you have here is this train becomes, culminates in the figures such as Swami Vivekanand, um, in particular him, but also Sri Aurobindo himself. Now, if you read their writings, it's quite interesting. They are both very, very proudly Hindu, unapologetically unapologetic Hindus. Uh, this is also true of Sachindranath Sanyal, of Savarkar, of Tilak, um, of um, uh, many of the other Bismil, and so on. And in every single case, however, they are also modernists because they are also trying to reform an ancient civilization to and its religious practices and, and its religious practices and philosophy and so on. So they are also modernizers at the same time. So it is very critical here to understand, first of all, the fact that they were unapologetic Hindus mm. should not be suggest that they are somehow bigots. Mm. For example, Savarkar's, uh, in fact, in many of these cases, their nearest uh, uh, lieutenant uh, was not a Hindu. Correct. So, for example, Savarkar's most important uh, lieutenant in his early years was Madam Bhikaji Kama. Uh, Bismil was very much a, uh, you know, he was much into the Shuddhi movement, he was a strong Arya Samaji and so on. Uh, but his closest lieutenant is Ashwakullah Khan. Uh, Tilak, uh, you know, the, the person who revived the Ganpati festival as a way of uh, political uh, mobilization. Uh, Joseph Baptiste is his, uh, is his closest ally. So, they were unapologetic Hindus, they were modernizers. But at the same time, they were not bigots. I mean, I think the problem here is that we try to put people into these boxes which is convenient to today's debates. Mm. At that time, there were many other things going on. There were some people who were nationalists and Marxists at the same time. Right. <laughs> Bhagat Singh being no, a good fact, example. Uh, please read the book and you will find that in a spectrum of revolutionaries and their associates, you will find um, a, a kind of a secular array of individuals who were, of course, using uh, their communities and, and and their traditions as as a basis of mobilization of motivation, but still modernizing. And it was across religions you saw this uh, tendency. And your book, in in some sense, illuminates that. So I think this is something that this book contributes, which I uh, got to learn from it. Now there's another uh, uh, very interesting nugget in your book, and this is pretty much towards the end of it, uh, or rather um, towards the, the second half of it. It's the iron plaque being worn by Sarvarkar in, in jail with mentioned 1960 uh, as a taunt that yes. he's going to be there forever. And of course, it is also uh, in many ways uh, uh, a, a, a sign of how uh, cruel or how uh, uh, many of our freedom fighters, revolutionaries were treated at that time. When we look back, why are we so obsessed with what I was mentioning to some others was tactical apologies or tactical repentance. Get out and attack them again, say sorry, yes. go out, attack them yes. again. Your book, you know, your book narrates this. Why are we so obsessed with having this uh, uh, perfect unified uh, example of behavior, not understanding that battles had to be won and you had to fight yes. another day? Why is it that we wanted the saint and the revolutionary at the same, in the same person. In fact, it made no sense even if he were a saint uh, to continue in jail. And since Savarkar is an extremely politically divisive figure today, uh, let me use another character who did similar things as well, uh, Sachindranath Sanyal. Mm -hmm. Sachindranath Sanyal was uh, involved with Raj Bihari Bose in trying to create this great insurrection in the First World War in the Indian Army. 
in the, he was nearly succeeded by the way, but it failed anyway. He was stuck in jail from 1915 to 1920. At 1920, he, like Savarkar, also wrote an apology letter and he was released uh, because of part of the amnesty after Jallianwala Bagh. He comes out, he promptly goes back to doing what he was doing before. Uh, and it is he who recruited the next generation of uh, 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 freedom fighters, uh, Bismil, Ashwakulla Khan, uh, Bhagat Singh, Chandrasekhar Azad, Rajguru, uh, Sukhdev Thapar, all of these characters, um, uh, Master Das, Surjo Sen, all of these people are his recruits. He then founds the Hindustan Republican Association. As um, the Honorable Minister was mentioning, he, is, he writes the, for the first time clearly that India after independence should become a democratic republic based on um, universal suffrage. So all of this he did only because he wrote that apology later and came out. Now it's a different matter that after a while the British understood what he was doing, stuck him back in jail after the Kakudi case. 1925 he goes back to jail, 1927 he sent back to Kalapani. He stays 10 years in Kalapani. Then in 1937 writes another letter, comes out. Then guess what he does? He goes and begins working with uh, Subhash Bose and Raj Bihari Bose and working against the, um, uh, the uh, working with the Japanese. So people don't realize that Subhash Bose and Raj Bihari Bose were in touch with each other and with the Japanese before the Second World War had started and they were already planning stuff. And so he does this. Subhash Bose of course escapes. Sachin Sanyal is stuck back into jail. And of course he dies in 1942. But what I'm trying to say is, here is a person who keeps writing these letters, mm. keeps coming out, keeps going and does exactly what he was doing. The British also know what he is doing, uh, that he's going to do this. But he's, that's the game they were playing. For the fact that he was writing these letters is surely meaningless to, uh, and the language he used, you know, your obedient servant, hardly suggests that Sachindranath Saniol was particularly obedient nor a, or a servant. Correct. Uh, so, you know, uh, let me, uh, and I'm going to come to you now. I promise you just one more question and then I'll turn to you. Uh, and you guys can come in and, and, and quiz uh, Sanjeev, all others, uh, please join in. Uh, one more question to you. Uh, why is it, when, you know, uh, and that struck me when the Honorable Home Minister was speaking, why is it that when the entire country, uh, as he mentioned, and perhaps, um, uh, 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 you know, we have to be, uh, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, looking at the times at that time, the size of the country, how difficult communication was, how difficult uh, in getting information across to each other was, if the entire country mourned uh, the hanging uh, of Bhagat Singh, as he mentioned, um, why is it that uh, in 1947, when India was rejoicing its freedom, uh, we were not able to build that moment of celebrating this, the other story, of celebrating, you know, the story would never have been another story had we had that ability as a nation to celebrate at that time, these revolutionaries as well. What was missing? What did we lack in not being able to rouse the sentiments and passions uh, of all the people who were celebrating freedom at last? And why were these left? So as I mentioned even earlier and the Honorable Minister also mentioned, uh, there were many aspects to this. One of them, of course, was that many of these, uh, uh, you know, basically the leadership of the revolutionary movement had been killed or had died from various causes by the time 1947 came. So they weren't around at the time that, that it happened, consequently not in a position to provide the kind of, uh, or be participant in the political transition that may have otherwise been if they had been there. If Netaji had been there, he would definitely have been an important character and on the transition or Rash Bihari Bose or any of the others. So the first and simple problem was uh, the, uh, the revolution, the, yeah, the tall figures were simply missing at the time that independence happened and many, in many cases simply being brutally killed. So that was one part of the problem. The other part of the problem was you have to remember where much of this revolutionary movement was happening. Uh, while it was happening in every part of the country, that they, they, the, the two, three places where it was real hotbeds. One was Bengal, particularly Eastern Bengal. The other was Punjab. And the third was Maharashtra, particularly among Maharashtrian Brahmins. Now what happens in 1947-48? Partition. The same people who were 
had been fighting for independence, you know, giving up their lives, giving everything up, suddenly find independence happens, but their own homes are lost to partition, on the, they fall on the wrong side. Happened to you know, my own mother's family, they fell uh, in Kushtia, which is in fact just a few kilometers across on the wrong side of the border. So they fell on the wrong side of the border, became revolutionaries, uh, sorry, became refugees. Uh, happened in Punjab as well and uh, many people in this audience may well have had families who face this uh, problem. Um, Maharashtra did not however face uh, partition, however their story is also pretty sad. Uh, while all communities in Maharashtra did participate in this, the Maharashtrian Brahmins had been very much uh, at the leading cutting edge of this, partly because they had this memory of the Maratha empire and so on. Now what happens that is that the British had throughout been investing heavily in anti-Brahminism in Maharashtra specifically. And at independence, of course, uh, just a few months after independence, uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi gets assassinated by a Maharashtrian Brahmin. So there is this huge outpouring of grief by the so-called Gandhians who then go on a rampage and there are huge riots across uh, Maharashtra in which the Brahmins are targeted, hundreds upon hundreds are killed. Thousands of houses are burnt down, a matter that was never investigated and to this day there's a hush-hush about this whole thing, to this day. Just to give an example, Savarkar's younger brother, Narayan Savarkar was stoned to death on the streets of Mumbai. Mahatma Gandhi's assassination was a sad thing, somebody was hanged for it. We have no idea who did it to Narayan Savarkar, nobody has ever been invested, nothing has ever been investigation and certainly nobody has been hanged for it. And so this is a sad fact that this is what happened to those communities who had fought for independence. And this didn't end even there. East Bengal Hindus were of course thrown out of their homes, but it didn't happen in one shot in 1947. They went through a second genocide in 1971. Mm. Millions of them came into India as refugees. And many of them then, in 1979, faced the Marijhapi massacre depends on how many people you think, somewhere between four and 10,000 people were massacred by Jyoti Basu's government in Morijhapi in Bengal. These same refugees. 1984, riots, the Sikhs who had been at the forefront of the revolutionary movement, again, were attacked and killed mercilessly on the streets of even this city. So the communities that had been at the forefront of the revolutionary movement, and I'm sorry to say, were not merely ignored, they were actively persecuted in modern India. Uh, Sanjeev, you're a policy maker and, and please do get my attention if you want to come in uh, and I'm going to come to you and if someone else, uh, if you want to ask a question and I'm coming to you as well. So uh, Sanjeev, you're a policy person who's been in negotiations, discussions. There was a book one of our foreign secretaries had produced the long game where he spoke about India-China negotiations. In fact, a few days ago I called him up after reading the book and I asked him to recant his conversation with me. He mentioned that when India and China negotiated, on one side was uh, Mao's uh, uh, diplomats, battle-hardened, having won their country. As, uh, you know, Pao Mao himself was, uh, was a commissar for the PLA, and um, they were coming in triumphant after having liberated and fought him. And on the other hand, we had uh, 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 negotiators who had uh, 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 seen non-violence as the means of of, of independence, who had seen negotiations as a way of outcomes, and there was a kind of a, uh, there were two different actors sitting on the table with two different skill sets. Do you think uh, incomplete storytelling about our past uh, has affected our ability to sometimes... Absolutely, negotiate? and in fact you brought up a very important issue. The people on our side were not merely those who had been a part of the non-violent movement, in fact there would have been very few of them, at least they had put up some fight. The bulk of our negotiators actually were civil servants who had collaborated with the British. So that is the more interesting story. And, and, and you do mention it here. Yes, in fact, since we have some, we have the vice chief of the Navy, he will he'll corroborate with me. The first Indian naval chief only happened in 1958. So for the first few decades, we basically the negotiation was being dealt, done by either collaborators or, by or in some cases the British who were collaborating on our behalf with the Chinese. So forget about uh, battle-hardened 
uh, scarred Chinese uh, generals or whatever, politicians uh, pushing back against us. Uh, we were not even represented by the people who won our freedom, mm. even including those who, who were involved in the non-violent movement. So I'm going to now take questions. I'll, I'll come to you and to both of you. Is there a mic here in the hall or should I get you one? Are there, are there some mics here? Maybe I can give you one. Uh, 1846 revolt. Uh, you know, war like 1857, the first re revolution that we had, the war of independence, it took them nearly 10 to 12 years to plan it out. And every war is like well planned. In 1946, it somehow happens that every single ship in India, British uh, Indian Army and, and Navy is revolting against them. But somehow it seems to be, um, there is no nervous center controlling it. How did it message pass through? How did they plan it and so well? And they were holding out Mumbai for so many days. So is there a was there a core committee which was working on it? Was how did that happen? Like it doesn't come through in, even in you in the new history video channels or things. Yeah. So keep the there is an element of the random in a, a revolt. So it's not like somebody was planning the exact revolt of the naval revolt of 1946, but it had been building up for a very long time. And as I said, the uh, Raj Bihari Bose and Sachin Sanyal had attempted in the First World War. Then Raj Biharin's Netaji attempted it and succeed partially with INA in the Second World War. And then when the revolt of 1946 happens, it's not planned in that sense, but certainly the case that there was all of this stuff that was bubbling. Remember, at the same time, the INA trials are going on. Uh, so you can imagine the mood. And the wider context also you need to take into account. Do remember that the war has finished. All the... British, Australian, American soldiers have all gone back home. They have been demobilized. They don't want to hang around. So who controls all these lib so-called liberated countries? The British Indian Army. The British Indian Army at that point held Egypt, Indonesia, Burma, M Singapore, Malaysia. Even Vietnam was held by Indian soldiers. Now this is the context in which this revolt uh, 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 is taking place. The British are genuinely scared that if this revolt happens, suddenly the Indians will end up with this gigantic empire. And you have in Indonesia, for example, uh, the Dutch trying to get in there, the Indonesian uh, sort of rebels or whatever you may, uh, nationalists fighting against them, and the Indian British, British Indian army being sent to quell them, in which many Indonesians died, but also hundreds of Indian soldiers died. So the Indian soldiers are, were on the verge of a massive revolt and the allied forces were very scared that not only would they revolt but remember they also have under them at that time tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of Japanese soldiers who had only just uh, surrendered and were fully trained. So it was only a matter of handing them some guns and get on with it. So this is the extremely wobbly conditions and mind you there are all these rumors that Netaji is still alive and so on. So this is the wider context. So it's not so much the step-by-step -step planning that matters, but the mahal, so to speak, was certainly an important part of, of what was going on in 1946 when the naval revolt took place. So, Sanjeev, I've been told just one more question, so I'm going to turn to Sir, here. I feel I'm in the newsroom asking you a question, but I have two, three important questions, or sub-questions. And please accept my congratulations for this absolutely marvelous book. Uh, much needed for the country. Uh, my first question is, as uh, Honorable uh, H.M. has talked about the Satrangi Sabhita of Jai Hind, but our books, my two questions are, why is Ahimsa so central to India's worldview, A, and why are we only talking of losing battles, Battle of Vandivash, Battle of Baksar, 1764-1760, we all know it by rote, my children know it by rote, all of us know that. What about the Cholas? What about the battles we have won, which we are not talking about? So I think this is a very important step and we must uh, make Gen X aware and millennia aware of how many people, I mean, including. So, so let me say that there are two parts to your question, but I think the bigger question that you ask is that our history that we learn in our textbooks at least is very peculiar. You have here a long history that is in where no matter when the battle happens, the Indians lose. 
वो बैटल ऑफ बक्सर हो इंडियंस लूज बैटल ऑफ प्लासी हो इंडियंस लूज द थ्री बैटल्स ऑफ पानीपत इंडियंस लूज नाउ माय क्वेश्चन व्हिच आई हैव बीन आस्किंग फॉर मेनी इयर्स इज श्योरली इफ वी आर स्टिल अराउंड वी मस्ट हैव वन सम बैटल्स इवन बाय बाय चांस सो आई बिगन टू इन्वेस्टिगेट दिस मैटर इनफैक्ट आई दिस इज अ कॉन्वर्सेशन आई हैड सम इयर्स अगो विथ अनदर राइटर विक्रम संपत who went on to investigate the matter and actually has written a book about it very nice book about it but the basic point is this once we began to investigate the matter we discovered that actually indians won lots of battles it's just that it's not there in our history books now i understand that a colonial power that was ruling over this would edit them out and it's done beautifully i have to credit colonial era historians for this you get the impression from my history that the mughals ruled us then a few years later the british ruled us the fact is that in between there was an 80 year period where the marathas ruled most of india now 80 years is not short the indian republic has still not existed for 80 years and they ruled from atok all the way to tanjavur so it's and they you know the peshwa baji rao the second ruled more of india than akbar did and yet you barely learn anything about them in fact the only reason you hear about baji rao is because of that movie called bastani which is actually you know almost uh, you know trivializes his life so this editing out happened which i uh, fair enough if you are a colonial power uh, you will do this question is why after independence did we want this narrative to be there and so here very much important part of this has got to be two things one is we have now talked quite a lot about one stream of the congress that came to power it's not all the whole all the streams of congress but one particular stream of congress that came to power then naturally wanted to exaggerate their own uh, uh, importance uh, they may have also gone ahead and also deliberately diminished the roles of others but the question is why about the longer history and there my investigation suggest that has lot to do with the fact that those who wrote our history in fact you look at an entire intellectual class after independence for the first two generation large proportion of them had been collaborators of the british so it was very important in a sense for their own story to themselves maybe to suggest that india was not a country before 1947 so all of these people were consequently not important and this old story had to be continued because otherwise they were going to say that we had been traitors so in order to kind of justify their own treachery and their own collaboration it was important to them that india had not been a country put together before 1947 and so they perpetuated these colonial era uh, stories so it is i mean this is quite astounding i mean i'll give you the example one example i do mention in the book is a famous hindi writer called yashpal he is literally the after premchand he is the second most important hindi writer and he made his name ironically by talking about his role in the freedom struggle much of which was made up because we now know that he was actually a police informer he was the almost certainly the source of information based on which chandrashekhar azad was trapped in in alabad and killed but yashpal then became after independence the greatest writer of hindi language so not surprisingly he uses pulpit to tell a particular story and this you see with many of the others you you scratch a little bit and you will find that they either they were or they were direct descendants of uh, the imperial police service officials uh, informers or contractors and so on who had deliberately and actively collaborated with the british as we close this evening i must again reiterate what i started this evening with read this book it is a very serious book that must must provoke serious debates the most heartening part about this book was sanjeev citing the work of vikram and i hope there are 30 other books that cite each other and build a a collection that problematizes some linear reproduction of our past none of this is absolute these are actually perceptions perspectives and lived experiences captured in these pages there are going to be different ones but they all must find place in our kaleidoscope of our own imagination of our ancestors and uh, congratulations sanjeev for beginning Thank this you. process and <laughs> since uh, smita is finally in the room 
your Junoon and her spirit are a deadly combination. Congratulations, Smita, for all you've done for helping him produce all these wonderful books and for your leadership as well. And Andrew, of course, congratulations to you as well. Continue with your journey as well. So thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we will meet you again soon at some other discussion. There's some tea uh, outside as well. I'll join you for that. <laughs> Evidently, everybody has drunk the tea.